Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today I'm continuing the study of the book of Acts. And I believe this is video number 24 in this series. Uh, if you have not seen all the previous videos, I hope you will go back and watch it all from the beginning. All the videos are uploaded and available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So I, of course, I started with Acts chapter 1, verse 1, and now I'm up to uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 1. And that's where I'll pick it up today. Now, I'm a KJV firstist, so I'll look at it first in the KJV. I might also look at it in the Amplified. Uh, sometimes I find that to be helpful. So beginning with Acts chapter 17, verse 1. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, uh, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. So that's verses 1 through 3. Uh, a lot of very important points made there. Um, Paul has, now this is Paul and Silas. Barnabas has left Paul over the argument they had over John Mark. So now Silas is Paul's uh, primary uh, co-worker. We also have the writer of the book of Acts, Luke, who's there during all of this. And that's, uh, sometimes he says, they, when he writes, sometimes he says we. So that's why, how we know that Luke is, is there during much of this. Um, so he, this is Paul's first missionary journey. And now he's reached a point where he's uh, coming to these cities, Amphilopus, Apollonia, and Thessalonica. But he goes to the synagogue of the Jews and it says, as his manner was. So every Sabbath, which is Saturday, not Sunday, um, this is the, the Jewish day of worship. This is where the, the day that the Jews met uh, in the synagogues. So Paul, even though he does not practice Judaism now that he's a, a Christian, he would still go on the Sabbath day to uh, the, the synagogues to preach to the, the Jews. So contrary to what a, a lot of people think and, and, and teach, that um, Paul is, quote, the apostle to the Gentiles, uh, he, he, he certainly hasn't given up on Jews. It says, as his manner was, Another place I think it says as custom was, so his routine. He would routinely go into a city and the first thing he'd do is find the synagogue and preach to the Jews. And it says that what he did, this was also his manner. Uh, he would reason with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered that means that he would be uh, the, the passion of Christ, where he was um, tried, beaten, uh, uh, scourged, uh, and, and then uh, crucified, uh, and then died and raised from, risen from the dead on the third day. All these things he's saying that this is what the scriptures said about Christ. So Paul would customarily go through the Old Testament scriptures, the law and the prophets. I think much of what he said would be found in Isaiah and Psalms. And he would show the Jews that, look, look what the, the, the prophets wrote about the Messiah, about the coming Christ. 
Well, all these things that they wrote about him, that he would suffer, die, and be raised from the dead, um, the prophecies are fulfilled. And they're fulfilled by this one person, Jesus of Nazareth. He is the Christ that was promised. This was his routine. This is what he would do every time he'd come into a new city. So, um, important th thing to understand here is that Paul did not concentrate only on Gentiles. He would, was still preaching to the Jewish people. Contrary to what uh, many people are teaching, that uh, Paul was not the only one that was preaching to the Gentiles. In fact, the, uh, 10 years earlier, Peter was called by God to preach to the Gentiles first. And Peter talks about how God chose him to first preach to the, the Gentiles. And he preached to uh, Cornelius and his family, and they got saved. And this caused a great controversy in the church uh, because the church was entirely made up of Jewish people who now believe that Jesus was the promised Messiah. Uh, they had no idea that uh, this message of salvation through faith in Jesus was also applied to Gentiles. And they also didn't realize that the practicing of Judaism, that they did so faithfully, that uh, that must be phased out. And these are the two uh, main misunderstandings of the, the early church. So in the book of Acts, we see how these two misunderstandings are addressed and, and corrected. Uh, the, the, the Gentiles uh, are preached to, and some people don't accept it very easily. You have still a lot of Jewish believers that don't want the Gentiles to be part of the church. And, and then if they... If, when they do accept them, they, they want to impose Judaism on them. And Peter said, how can you impose Judaism and the laws of Moses on them? We haven't even been able to keep it. And you want to impose it on the Gentiles now? Uh, not only circumcision, but all the laws of Moses, all the dietary laws, all these things that they people wanted to impose on Gentiles now. So... Um, uh, Peter was the first one to preach to the Gentiles 10 years earlier. Gentiles had been getting saved all this time. Uh, and yet Paul, now he's preaching to the Gentiles, but he hasn't given up on preaching to the Jewish people. He would still customarily go to the synagogue. First time, first thing he did when he arrived in the city, that's what he would do. Um, and uh, by the way, the message he preached was that the, the uh, Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection that we preach now to, uh, that we want you to put your faith in, that Jesus died for your sins and he rose from the dead and, and that faith in him is what's required of you. Uh, this is, is Paul's message, but he's pointing out that this is what was taught all through the law and the prophets. This is what was prophesied. This is not some brand new idea a uh, brand new gospel that, that, that uh, they just discovered. It was, it was written about uh, 700 years earlier by Isaiah, a thousand years earlier by David, and uh, indications of it go back even back into uh, Genesis. So um, that's what Paul was doing, every city he came into. And now let's go to verse four. Oh, let me read these first three verses in the Amplified, see how it phrases it. Now, after Paul and Silas had traveled through Amphilopus, no, Amphipolis and Apollonia, uh, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews, and Paul entered the synagogue, as was his custom, and for three Sabbaths, he engaged in discussion and friendly debate with them from the scriptures, explaining and pointing out scriptural evidence 
that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed. All right, now back to the KJV in, in verse uh, four. And some of them believed and, and consorted with Paul and Silas. Now, this is referring to the, the, the Jews, the people who were in the synagogue practicing Judaism. Some of them believed. Uh, and of the devout Greeks, a multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. So the Jewish believers, uh, maybe these were Greek proselytes that were Greeks who were practicing Judaism, or maybe these were just Greeks. It's not clear at this point if it's referring to, to uh, Gentiles, uh, who are Gentiles or just the non-Jews. Um, Verse 5, but the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. So I'm assuming that Jason is where Paul and Silas were staying. So the Jews that rejected the, the message that Paul had for them in the synagogues, that the Messiah you've been waiting for has come. It's Jesus. Uh, and the, those Jews that rejected it, they wouldn't just reject it and that's, that's it. Okay, we just disagree. Let's just agree to disagree. No, they, <laughs> they disagreed so adamantly that they wanted to, uh, cause the city to come against them. It's happened in the previous chapters too, where they want to bring the people against them. They, they actually stoned Paul and left him for dead in the last chapter. Uh, but he wasn't dead, or maybe he was dead and he was resurrected, I don't know. But uh, uh, they, they, their reaction to Paul's message is not just, okay, we just disagree. They they wanted to kill him. That's how much they disagreed. Now, how much they were offended by Paul's message. Verse six. And when they found them not, that's in the in the house of Jason. They drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, "These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received." And these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar. So now what they're doing is the same thing that, that the Sanhedrin did with Jesus uh, uh, and, and Caiaphas. Uh, their argument with uh, they brought to Pontius Pilate was not that he's a blasphemer and he's claiming to be the son of God. Uh, that's really the the um, the charge that the Sanhedrin had against him, but the charge that they brought to Pontius Pilate was uh, a, a a political argument that uh, he's he, he he's uh, claiming to be king of the Jews, and therefore uh, Pontius Pilate, the Roman government, must do something about it. So now these people are taking the same approach. It's not theological. It's uh, political. It says, Whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. So it worked. It worked uh, so well that they, they were able to uh, crucify Jesus. Let's take this same uh, strategy now and use it to uh, kill uh, Paul and Silas. Let me read those verses in the Amplified, starting with verse 4. And some of them were persuaded to believe and joined Paul and Silas, <clears throat> along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and many of the leading women. But the unbelieving Jews became jealous, and taking along some thugs, 
from the lowlifes in the marketplace, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. And then, attacking Jason's house, tried to bring Paul and Silas out to the people. But when they failed to find them, they dragged Jason and some brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men have turned the world upside down. No, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Turned the world upside down. So they're, um, they're admitting that uh, Paul and Silas and, uh, and also, you know, the other apostles, Peter, um, they, there has been a, a, a great effect of the preaching. Every time Peter preached, thousands of people are being converted. And now Paul is off in the Gentile world. He's doing the same thing. But the argument is not that Paul's telling the Gentiles about Jesus. The argument here is these Jews don't want uh, Paul and Silas preaching this in the synagogues to the Jews. And so, but they they don't bring that to the authorities. Instead, they bring to the authorities that they're preach uh, preach some kind of uh, of a, a political rebellion that Caesar is not the true king. Um, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here too, and Jason has welcomed them into his house and protected them. And they all are saying the things contrary to the decrees of Caesar, actually claiming that there is another king, Jesus. Okay, verse 8 in the KJV. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, uh, they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who, coming thither, went into the synagogue of the Jews. So, Paul and Silas somehow are able to hide and avoid this mob that's coming for them. And they are able to get them out of the city Jason and others were able to somehow get Paul and Silas out safely. In, that, in other cities, they weren't able to get them out so safely. As I said, previous city might have been even uh, uh, Antioch. But I, that was in the last, the last video. Paul was not got, didn't get out safely. He was stoned. And and uh, taken outside the city and stoned, left for dead. So they're still determined to kill Paul, but he's able to escape. And now they go to Berea, another town. And what does he do? He immediately goes into the synagogue of the Jews again. This is his custom, his routine, his, his uh, as it says in verse... Uh, to his manner. He he always did this. Every city he went to, he went right to the synagogue, knowing that some of the Jews would believe, but some of them would want to kill him. He's already quite famous uh, and infamous. Famous is being, you're, you're well known in a good way. And infamous is you're well known in a bad way and you're hated. Now, it says of these people in Berea, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica. It might be pronounced Thessalonica, I don't know. In that, in, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Uh, therefore, many of them believed and also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. So, the the the, the people in in um, Berea, they 
they it says that they believed or it said they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so this verse 11 is the premise of, of what is called being Berean. It's based on this town of Berea and the people's response to Paul and Silas's message. They received it, they were open-minded about it, but they were not just going to accept it without checking the scriptures for themselves. And so we have this term Berean, which tells us that, hey, uh, listen to people, hear them out, have an open mind, but go to the scriptures to find out if it's so. Uh, this is where we get the, the, the term that came out of the Reformation, sola scriptura. We must only rely on the scriptures for our conclusions and our doctrines. Listen to people. Be fair. Give everybody a fair hearing, but go to the scriptures and your conclusion must be based upon what the scriptures say, not what men say, not the traditions of men. Now, verse 12, uh, Therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few, so a lot of people. It says many of them believed, and it says not a few. Verse 13, but when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached to Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. This was the same thing that happened in the last chapter. It seems to be a pattern. Uh, Paul will preach at the synagogue. Some believe. Some want to hate him and kill him. He leaves. And then they're not content that he's gone. They, when they hear he's in another city, they've got to go pursue him there. They're just determined to kill Paul and stop this teaching. I don't think they could care less that Paul was just preaching to the Gentiles, but they're, what they're angry about is that their Judaism, they're offended that Paul is teaching that uh, Jesus is the promised Messiah. And not only that, what makes it, what makes it even worse is the fact that Paul teaches that circumcision is not required. Uh, Peter taught that the dietary laws are not required. This is what he got from his vision that God gave him before he went to see uh, Cornelius and his family. He learned that nothing is unclean. They no longer consider the, the, the dietary laws of Judaism. They no longer apply. No longer consider Gentiles as unclean. And you need to separate from them. They're welcome them. They're equal. They're all the same. Uh, so this idea that the, the Judaism uh, and uh, that Judaism is being phased out was very, very offensive. The idea that Gentiles are uh, should be um, uh, accepted instead of being segregated from them, uh, that was offensive to these people. Let me read this in the Amplified. Verse 10. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they entered the Jewish synagogue. Now these people were more noble and open-minded than those in Thessalonica. So they received the message of salvation through faith in Christ with great eagerness examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. As a result, many of them became believers, together with a number of prominent Greek women and men. But when the Jews of Thessalonica learned that the word of God concerning eternal salvation through faith in Christ had also been preached by Paul at Berea, they came there too, agitating and disturbing the crowds. So now let's go to verse 14 in the KJV. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go 
as it were to the sea. But Silas and Timotheus abode there still. That's interesting. I don't remember that Paul and Silas, they were separated at this point. Uh, verse 15. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens and received a commandment unto Silas and Timothy, Timotheus for to come to him with all speed. They departed. So, uh, instead of Paul, Silas, and Timothy all going to uh, Athens, to Athens. Uh, Paul goes by sea for some reason. It's not we're not told why. Silas and Timothy left or left behind, but then word is sent to them, and they they immediately depart to go join Paul in Athens. Verse sixteen. Well, let me read that in the Amplified. It might help. Verse 14, so at that time, the brothers immediately sent Paul away to go as far as the sea. Maybe they just want to get Paul away, primarily concerned with him. He's the primary villain, um, according to these Jews. They hated him. It, was, um, it seemed like they were, they didn't like the teaching by anybody, but especially this notorious Paul, who's a traitor, because he was, uh, he was one of the most religious and respected of the, the Jews in, 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 uh, uh, be, before he was converted to Christianity. Uh, he was Saul of Tarsus. Uh, he studied our, under Gamaliel, and he was very, very learned and respected as a Jewish scholar. Uh, and then he was appointed as the one to... when. The Jews first started becoming Christians. He was the point, appointed to go arrest them, bind them up, and they suffered greatly under Paul's persecution. And, th and then this leader of the, the Jews who wanted to stop this new sect of Judaism, that's why it was considered initially, it was another sect of Judaism. He, he was there to determined to put a stop. And then on the road to Damascus, Jesus appears to him and he's converted and and, 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 and then he becomes the apostle Paul and, and he has this great success. So they they not only hate the message, but they hate the fact that Paul is a traitor, that he he was one of them. He was he was the most determined to stop this new sect is even a, a cult uh, and, and, and yeah now he's one of the leaders of it so maybe this is why they really wanted to kill Paul and Paul had to be taken away by ship to escape the others were not maybe so concerned for their life and in the previous chapter the one that was stoned was Paul Here, it doesn't say anything about Silas being stoned why didn't they stone Silas and Timothy along with Paul why didn't they stone all of them it was Paul that was singled out and stoned. So now Paul is singled out and told, and he has to be sent by ship to escape. And now Timothy and, and Silas go join him. Uh, then it says, and it's still in the Amplified, those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens, and after receiving instructions from Paul for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible, they left. Now verse 16 in the KJV. Now while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Now this word holy is W-H-O-L-L-Y. So it means they were entirely given over to idolatry in Athens. Verse 17. Therefore disputed he that's Paul, in the synagogue with the Jews, again, in Athens. Why, where is he? In the synagogue, disputing with the Jews, and with devout persons, and in the market daily with them that he that met him. So in the market, I'm assuming maybe he was speaking to Gentiles in the marketplace, but at the synagogue he was 
is speaking with the Jews. Verse 18, then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. These are different uh, types of philosophy, Epicureanism and Stoicism. Um, and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, uh, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. So this was something that uh, was totally different. They hadn't heard this before. And they were very, as philosophers, they're very interested in learning about every kind of philosophy. Uh, so they got interested. Uh, and they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. Verse 21. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. So they, their, their, just, their time was spent in nothing else but just pursuing philosophy. And they wanted to learn anything that was new they wanted to hear about. And their own particular philosophies, they wanted to share those. So ideas were going back and forth. And uh, they were interested in Paul's new, this new foreign teaching from Paul. Let me read that in the Amplified. Verse 16, now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was greatly angered when he saw that the city was full of idols. So he had discussions in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and in the marketplace day after day with any who happened to be there, and some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to engage in conversation with him. There's a footnote here. B. Epicurean. Let me see what it says. Uh, these were among the leading philosophies of the day. Neither believed in a personal God. Indeed, the Epicureans were confirmed atheists. Their goal was to get as much out of life as possible. The Stoics had a strong fatalistic sense of duty seeking to improve the inner man. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and some said, what could this idle babbler with his eclectic scrap heap learning have in mind to say? So they didn't really initially have any respect for him. They thought he was perhaps some kind of a fool, a babbler. But though they're the way they were about learning, they, they still wanted to learn about it. And others, not these people, these people were just skeptics and dismissed him. But it says, others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. <clears throat> so they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, it's, there's a footnote. Uh, it says the hill of Eris, the Greek god of war. And let me see what the footnote says. <clears throat> also known as Mars Hill, named for Mars, the Roman god of war. It was the place where the ancient Greek Areopagus council convened and had varying powers in the course of its history. <clears throat> In Roman times, it was where the supreme government of Athens met. So this is where they take Paul. And they say, may we know what this strange new teaching is which you are proclaiming? For you are bringing some startling and strange things to our ears. So uh, we want to know what they mean. 
Now all the Athenians and the foreigners visiting there used to spend their leisure time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. All right, so now back to verse 22 in the KJV. Uh, then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, <clears throat> Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. <clears throat> That's an interesting start. It's not a, it's, it's not a, uh, flattering or, uh, or not, uh, a, th a thing to say that's going to try to make them praise them. It's being superstitious is a, a superstition is something that you believe in that's foolishness. So that's not a good opening line, in my opinion, in Paul's message. In verse 23, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you. So saying they ignorantly worship, you know, ignorant just simply means that uh, it's, uh, if you're ignorant of something, it means it's a subject that you don't have knowledge about. It's not intended to mean that you're stupid, you're unable to learn, you're of low intellect. Uh, it, it just means that you it's a subject you haven't learned yet. We're all ignorant about most things. Uh, if we take all the knowledge that there is in the universe, I mean, Einstein said we don't even know 1% of nothing. So we're all primarily ignorant. There are some subject matters that we study and we get knowledge on that subject. But overall, we're, we're all quite ignorant. Uh, so being ignorant is not really a pejorative, but but it, it is offensive. Uh, many people are offended if you, you, you say that they're ignorant. But the fact is, we are all ignorant. Um, so he says, ye ignorantly worship this unknown God. Him declare I unto you. So Paul says, I'm going to tell you about this unknown God that you're worshiping. Verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we all for we are also his offspring. So uh, they they have all these various religious and philosophical viewpoints. It's it's uh, and I. I guess it's it's very uh, very liberal. The government is very liberal about religions, and uh, very uh, they're not trying to impose a singular religion on the people. Uh, there's religious freedom, it seems, and uh, so they have all these religious views, and there's polytheism is is existing, atheism is existent there, uh, and yet. Uh, Paul says, there's this one God you have a statue of called the unknown God. That is the one true God. And he's the one I'm here to tell you about. So he's saying, you've, you've, you've missed it. You have a statue about this unknown God and all these other things are wrong. And the one truth, one, the one true God you, you recognize, but you don't know him. <laughs> 
He's unknown. You're ignorant of him. And I'm here to tell you about him. And he's the one who's created all things, and all things exist through him. Let me read this in the Amplified. So Paul, standing in the center of Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I observe with every turn I make throughout the city that you are very religious and devout in, in all respects. Now, as I was going along and carefully looking at your objects of worship, I came to an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Therefore, what you already worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who created the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he is served with human hands as though he needed anything, because it is he who gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their lands and territories. This was so that they could seek God, if perhaps they might grasp for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. That is, in him we actually have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are, for we also are his children. That's through verse 28. All right, back to the KJV in verse 29. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art or man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So he, he's saying, look, uh, there is this one true God, and God created man, and from that man all the peoples of the world have come from. This God is the one true God, and he's not you shouldn't think of him as like uh, as he as he's represented in these temples with all the art and the statues. Um, it, uh, it says graven by art and man's device. No, he he, he says that you're you're ignorant about this true God, and until now God has winked at it. In other words, God's permitted it. But now he commands, God commands all men everywhere to repent. That means to change your mind. Now, what do they need to change their mind about? Verse 31, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. This resurrection is really of great interest to these people. This is very foreign, uh, foreign to all their philosophies. So he's saying, you need to repent. You need to change your mind. All mankind needs to change their mind. No longer believing in all these gods, man-made gods, all these other philosophies. He says, no, you need to change your mind. And the day has come, the day will come of a judgment and he says, the ju in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man, by that man, Jesus. So you're going to be judged in righteousness by Jesus. In other words, you will be judged righteous or not righteous by what you do with this Jesus and this message I have for you. And God raised him from the dead. So this resurrection from the dead is what God has done to give you the proof that you would need, the confidence that 
Jesus is this Savior. Jesus is this one true God, and that you need to repent and no longer believe in these other things and instead believe in Jesus. This is how your God will deem you as righteous or not, by what you do with Jesus. And, and uh, verse 32, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, among the which was Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So this message or sermon on Mars Hill that Paul just gave here, um, some of the people, what were the reactions? Some of them mocked him. Others said, well, I want to hear more about this. And then others believed and wanted to tag along. So they cleaved, they cleaved unto him. They tagged along with him. They followed Paul and their believers. So you have the mockers, the people who want to learn more, and the ones that have already become believers now. But you don't have this fourth category here that you've seen other places, the people that want to stone Paul and kill him. So that's good. At least they don't want to kill Paul uh, because he has a, a philosophy, a, a new religious uh, teaching. Uh, but in the synagogues, that's what happens. They, when he preaches in the synagogues, it's very common. That's what they want to do. Some believe. If they don't believe, they want to kill him. That's the reaction of the Jews. Either believe, we either believe you or we'll kill you. Now let me read this final portion here and me amplify it. So then, being God's children, we should not think that the divine nature, the deity, is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination or skill of man. Therefore, God overlooked and disregarded the former ages of ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent, that is, to change their old way of thinking, to regret their past sins. Well, See, this is the Amplified. They've got to, they've got to uh, take the word repent and associate it with sin. Nowhere in there should we conclude that there's repentance has anything to do with sin or changing your life, changing your ways. They did have it right. It was very good up to that point. Let me read that again. Now, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. That is, to change their old way of thinking. Change your old way of thinking. No longer think about, value these other philosophies, these other religious viewpoints, these other gods. Re reject all that. Um, verse, uh, verse 31, the Amplified. Because he has set a day when he will judge the inhabited world in righteousness, by a man whom he has appointed and destined for that task. And he has provided credible proof to everyone by raising him from the dead. Now that was beautifully stated. This is really the whole significance of this bodily resurrection of Jesus. It's the proof that God gives us. When, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, Baptist, the, the, the very, uh, and the, the Jews immediately had, had wanted to have some kind of a sign from him. And he, he, this is the first chapter of the Gospel of John. And he said, I'll destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. They said, well, it took our fathers 40 years to build a temple. You're saying you can rebuild it in three, in three days? And he, and he said, well, he thought, He's, it says that he was th not thinking about the, uh, the temple in um, Jerusalem, but the temple of his body, which would be crucified, buried, and resurrected in th on the third day. During his three and a half year ministry, he offered many, many signs and wonders, but he all said, also said later when they demanded the sign from him, he said, the sign I will give you is the sign of Jonah. 
just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Uh, and uh, so this sign that he's promised is the, uh, the, t the temple of his body being destroyed and raised up. The, the, the sign that he, he explained it another way that he would be buried in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights and then raised back to life. This is the sign that he said is the proof that his claims are true. What did he claim? He claimed that he came down from heaven. He's eternal God Almighty, and, but he came down from heaven and became a man for the purpose of dying. And, and that, that dying served the purpose of paying for the sins of the whole world. And that he would uh, be raised from the dead to prove that he is God, he is the Savior. He would pay for the sins of the world. And through faith in him and, 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 and in what he's done for you, which is paying for your sins. Uh, and and your, your faith in him to provide salvation for you, that, that, that is the means of salvation. And this resurrection, this bodily resurrection of Jesus was the proof. So they, they stated correctly here in the Amplified when it said, and he has provided credible proof to everyone by raising him from the dead. Verse 32 in the Amplified. Now, when they heard the term resurrection from the dead, some mocked and sneered, but others said, we will hear from you again about this matter. So Paul left them, but some men joined him and believed. Among them were Dionysius, uh, it says a judge. So I guess Dionysius was a judge. Uh, gee. There's a footnote for G. Oh. No. So Dionys Dionysius is a judge of the Council of Areopagus. Hmm. So Dionys Dionys when it says in the, amp the KJV, which was Dionysius is the Areopagite. The Amplified says that means that he's a judge uh, of the Council of Areopagus. And a woman named Damaris and others with them. All right, so that concludes the, the study of uh, chapter 17. <clears throat> so you, um, I, I hope you understand not only these historic events that we get uh, um, in, in great detail given to us by, uh, by Luke, uh, you understand the historical implications of all this, that the first 30 years of church history are, are we, we get an account of in the book of Acts and the transition, the transformation of the early church from thinking it's only for the Jews, but now, no, it's for everybody. Uh, and that Judaism would be continue to be practiced. No, Judaism must be discarded and your faith has to be on Jesus, not in circumcision or anything else. So uh, these are the things that we get from the book of Acts. Uh, but the most important thing to understand is here, this final point here, that salvation is offered to everyone uh, as a free gift from Jesus to you right now. If you just believe that Jesus is your Savior, he died for your sins, and you're going to go to heaven because of Jesus and what he's done for you, then then you have eternal life given to you at that moment. And the resurrection of Jesus is the proof that God gave us so that we can have confidence that our faith is justified. I hope you put your faith in him now. Thank you for watching. And uh, next time I'll begin with chapter 18. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.